Hey, my name is Steve, composer, engineer, and lecturer, and welcome back to the channel and your first steps into the contact sampler. Well done, you've reached the end of this course, not just of this chapter, but of this whole series. You should feel proud that you've made it all the way through. It can be quite challenging, but now that you've got the skills, you'll be able to create your own library and I'm excited to see what you create. So there is just one more thing I wanna talk about, which is how to save your library properly and prep it for distribution, maybe to a community like Pianobook. And I'm gonna share some helpful resources both on this channel and others so that you can continue to learn if you want to. With all of that to cover, let's embark on our final video of this series. So in order to make sure that your library sort of turns up in the right spot with all the samples laid out correctly, all the knobs, all of the backgrounds and all that fun stuff, we need to make sure we save it in a particular way. We also need to make sure that we test it because otherwise, how do we know it works? If you posted it to somewhere like Piano Book, for example, and then a bunch of people couldn't open it or couldn't use it, that would be a shame. So a few of these helpful tricks on how to save and how to test will really help you make sure that it's ready to go. Honestly though, I mean, mistakes are gonna happen. Errors are gonna occur. Things are gonna go wrong. That's the nature of digital files, to be honest, and sharing things online. Some things could go wrong. Some things you might not pick up. Some things people just might not like about the library. They might not like the way that you've set it up or the way that you've set that feature. Don't be disheartened by this. This is all just part of the creative process. This is how we learn. Embrace that feedback, take it on board and see what you can do to make it better. Okay, so let's take a look at our instrument. Here is our completed instrument. I've uh, popped in all the other controls. I haven't quite tied off all the controls perfectly to what I want them to do yet. Uh, but this is good enough for now for me to be able to test and, and show you this today. If you keep watching to the end though, I'm gonna share with you what it looks like now and the version that you can download on Pianobook. Spoiler alert, it looks quite different to this with a lot more controls. Now this library we've been building, we've been scripting, we've been doing that all in behind the scenes here in the spanner section, of course. And this is when we're in the spanner section where we can come up to the save icon and save the instrument. You may remember from a previous video, I said, you know, might be an idea to save versions in case you wanted to go back a step, maybe the version before you started scripting. So you could go back to before the script was started, for example. This just sort of helps you go back if you need to, particularly in your early days when you're first learning this stuff, you might wanna just be able to just jump back a step. Undo might not be enough. You might just wanna go back to the beginning and try again. That's okay, that's part of the process. Now though, we wanna save the official instrument. This is the one we wanna share and test. So I'll go to save edited instrument and I've created a test folder and this folder is gonna contain the instrument and all the samples. So ideally this would be named whatever the instrument is named. Although of course you can change that later, not a problem. Now we've been saving as patch only, saving just what we're doing inside contact, inside with scripting and setting up the groups and all that jazz. Now though, we're actually gonna save a patch and samples. And you'll notice that the absolute sample pass is no longer an option. Now I never recommended selecting that box in the first place, but the reason why you don't select that is because every computer is going to be different. Every computer doesn't have your user folder. So it's never gonna be able to find the file if it's set to an absolute file path because it's gonna be expecting your computer's file path. When you save as patch and samples, it saves the patch itself and the samples in a folder with all the resources that it needs inside one folder that you can zip up and share and play on any computer. You won't be locked to certain file paths. It won't open up saying there are things missing. Hugely beneficial. All right, so I'm gonna give it a name, just Folon, and I'm gonna hit save. Now, when I go to this file, I can see my library there, my patch, and this folder full of samples. If I go into here, we've got all the samples that I've included so far. And if I add any more, they'll start to be populated in here. And we've even got a folder for our wallpaper. Here is our wallpaper that we put into the back of our instrument. And there's even a folder there for the IR or the impulse response of the reverb we're using. So you can see how patch and samples just groups together all the resources that it needs, puts it all into a convenient package, and then you just zip that folder. So here's the folder. I would just right click and compress. It's just gonna take a moment to compress all the files into one convenient zipped file. And there it is. Now that zip isn't something that you play. It's something that would need to be opened up on the other person's computer and then they could dive into the same folder structure 
open up your instrument and play it from there. But zipping it together makes sure that the file structure remains intact and it never gets separated and it treats it like one file. So when you're uploading it to the web or uploading it to Google Drive or another sort of system, it doesn't get broken up and that's hugely important. Now in that example, of course, I saved it into a new location. I wasn't saving it in the same place that I saved all my other, you know, V2, V3 and so on patches. That's because I wanted a clean slate, something that I could go pick up, zip and share easily. That's just the way I work, but I think the biggest benefit is the fact that you have a clean folder setup. You have a folder and inside that folder is a folder full of samples and your patch. It's nice and neat, there's no extra weight. It's just the instrument and its samples. Okay, now let's jump over and take a look at testing the library. Okay, so when it comes to testing your library, you probably want another computer in order to do this on. If you've accidentally saved absolute file path or it works on your computer because of your particular version, you won't really know something's wrong until you try it on a different computer. So I would definitely recommend if you've got on hand another computer, give it a go, see how it sounds. If not, see if you can borrow a computer or there is another way I'll share in a moment. So I've opened it up here on my desktop and I, as soon as I hit some keys, I'm getting that beautiful sound coming through, which is fantastic. Now, essentially what we wanna do is make sure that all the controls are working. So I will come in here and see if I can turn that one down and play it again. Yes, there is a sound change. Perfect, that's exactly what we want. That control is working. Essentially, we would go through and try every control, every single one to see if it works. And then maybe try it in different combinations. If you started from left to right, go right to left. Try them at random. Try different controls with other controls. What does it sound like if you open up the attack all the way and still feed it through to reverb? What happens if you speed up attack all the way? Is there a click? If you pull out all layers but one, is there a significant volume drop? Does the cutoff filter work as expected? These are all questions that you're asking yourself when you're playing around with this library to see if everything works. No doubt throughout the entire time that you've been coding the library, you've been trying things and, and seeing if they work. So it's just the same process. Now, if you don't have another computer, there is another way you can test, but it's gonna rely on having a buddy. Having a sampling buddy or someone that can help kind of test your library for you is a great way of getting kind of live feedback. Real life, real world examples of your instrument in action to see if it actually works. You know, we test them on our computer in our way, in the way that we would write with that library, in the way that we would write our own music, but someone else might write differently. Someone else might use entirely different controls with other controls, might try things that you wouldn't have thought to try. So having a sampling buddy that can help test out everything is really, really useful. Now, of course, that does mean that that other person has to have contact in order to make it work and they have to have the contact version that you've used or higher to make it work as well. So if you've done a contact six library and they've only got contact five, that's not gonna be an option. The other thing as well is that, you know, people are people, people are busy, people are doing lots of different things. Sometimes you can't rely on the other person to be available at the time you need them to be. Such is the nature of this industry a lot of the time. However, if it does work out, if you do have someone you can rely on, fantastic, because that is a great way of getting live feedback. Now, if you don't have another person and another computer, another great way of testing your library is to write with it. Compose a song, write something with it. That way you're forcing yourself to use your library in a creative way as you intend other people to use it. So often when we're writing our library, all we're doing is the kind of like plonking the keyboard and trying to make sounds, especially if you're me and not a keyboard player. So actually putting it into a musical perspective where you can program in MIDI or slow it down so you can play something in and that, that forces you to engage with it in a creative way. It's a way that's gonna find bugs easier or maybe not even bugs, but things you don't find working in your workflow. For example, you may have given yourself a low pass filter and what you actually need is a high pass filter, or you need to have a high pass filter as well as a low pass filter. These sorts of things only really come up probably while you're using it in a creative way, trying to develop a track, and then you come across something and you're like, oh, I wish it did this. It's a great way of testing your library. So those are three great ways of testing your library and I strongly encourage you to test it thoroughly before you start sharing it. That way you can try and get as many of the bugs, as many of the issues, as many of the problems with it ironed out before you share and there's less for you to deal with later. Now, I'm someone who has released some sample libraries before. I enjoy making them on a fairly regular basis and I've 
added to this library. I've made some additional changes on top of what we've done in this course. And I wanna show you what some of those changes look like and where some of those resources are to help you get to that same point to continue your learning. So this is my Foalon interface. Looks quite different, doesn't it? What I'm using here are some custom graphics and I actually have a great tutorial course, a three-part video course on how to get your own custom knobs, switches, everything into contact. It is a bit of a tricky process. It's probably not something you might do on the first library you create. You might wanna just kind of get familiar with the scripting interface first, develop up your first library, and then, you know, for the next time or afterwards, try and add in some custom graphics. But if you are interested and you wanna be able to see how it is that I get to this point with these custom graphics and knobs and sliders and whatnot, check above and below for the link to the three-part contact custom graphics course. Essentially, a lot of these controls are still the same. We've still got a cutoff knob, for example. We've still got some reverb knobs, although I've got a couple of different reverb options. I've still got my layers mixing, although they're vertical sliders now, they go up and down rather than left to right. And all of these knobs, of course, have very different custom settings and, and a very different custom kind of look to them. The background is still the background. And in fact, all these titles, these squares and boxes, all of this stuff here, that's all baked into the background. And all I've done is then call in my UI elements, my sliders, my knobs, and I've attached custom graphics to them so they look a particular way. So all of that is something you can find out in my three-part contact course if you'd like. The other thing you can see here is obviously there are a lot more controls. There's a lot more effects controls. There's some saturation phase, some delay, a couple of different types of reverb, but all of these are using exactly the same processes we've already seen in this contact tutorial series. None of this is any different. I've just created more knobs with more effects attached to them in exactly the same way as I did before. So really it's up to you how much of this you wanna add on. I've also added in these tape sounds. If I flick over all of these, I've reprocessed all four groups and added in four more groups of tape processing sound. Just a bit of fun, bit of a different texture. I've always liked that kind of like tape processing as an option because it adds something that's a little bit unusual. So. That's there. And because tape usually has noise, but as we found out in chapter one, we wanna kind of remove that noise so that the noise doesn't build up as you add more and more notes. I've actually added in a separate noise layer. So I can blend this one in and put that noise back in. Just something very simple that I've thrown in there. Now I will take a look at doing a video about how I created that noise because it is a little bit different from the other groups. And that's actually a great segue into telling you about this particular playlist, Above and Below You'll Find. It's how I built all of my contact libraries. I often will share videos deconstructing how I've scripted something or how I developed something for each of the libraries that I create. I've got some libraries coming up on XY pads, for example, from my recent Ambido library. Those can be really, really useful if you're looking to push yourself a little bit further and try new things and if you see something in one of my libraries and you're like how do you do that how do how is that created this is the playlist for you so if you want to push beyond and start to find your feet with some more complex controls maybe check out that playlist as well a lot of the time it's me discovering that type of stuff as well and learning how to do that and then putting it out there so that you can too now, of course, talking about resources, there are some great YouTube channels out there as well as mine to be able to help you get the most out of contact. A lot of them are connected quite well with Piano Book. There are people like David Hillowitz, Dan Keen, John Meyer, Hunter Rogerson, and the broader Piano Book channel. Across both Piano Book and Spitfire Audio, there's often some sampling tutorials. While I hope this course has given you a strong foundation, those are great resources as well as my How Do I Build My Libraries playlist to help you go a little bit further maybe and spark some new ideas. These are channels that I love and I watch all the time and I hope you do too. The other thing that I'm actually planning on doing and I hope that this might help you a little bit is to create a bit of a knowledge base for Command Shift New. And in that knowledge base will definitely be a section for contact. What I envisage this to be is a sort of database of all of the things that we cover in these videos, key information 
and sometimes going a little bit further, all in a written quick format with code examples and all that sort of fun stuff. That way, if you've forgotten how to put together a knob, you can watch the video, but you can also consult the article. Once I've got that up and running, I will update this video with that link. So do check back when that happens. Ultimately though, I am by no means stopping the contact content. I will definitely be doing more tutorials, definitely more dives, and definitely some more free libraries for you to download. So do consider subscribing. It is a great way to stay connected. All right, congrats again on completing this course. This is fantastic for you. And don't forget, you can always come back. You can always come back and revisit Visit those videos if you're unsure on how to do something or forget something. I hope to see your library popping up onto Piano Book one day soon as well. It'll be fantastic. Leave a comment below when that happens. Don't forget, of course, to subscribe and ding that bell. That way you're notified when I release another contact tutorial or something else that might take your fancy. That's all for this series. So until I see you in the next one, I will catch you later.